Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Today, we're going to talk about growing succulents. Also, Mr. D is going to talk about the different ways insecticides kill bugs. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dale Skaggs. Dale is the Director of Horticulture at the Dixon Gardens, and Mr. D is here today. Howdy, Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having us. All right, Dale, let's talk about succulents. So what do we mean when we say succulents? Well, succulent plants are typically thought of as, uh, well, I like to call them fat, lazy plants, okay? <laughs> okay. Because they're, they're, uh, they're, their tissues are sort of swollen and very fleshy, and that's how, that's how you identify them as succulent plants. A lot of people think succulents are cacti, mm -hmm. and it's true, all cacti are succulents, but, but not all succulents are cacti. All right. Um, they're sort of defined by these little spiny cushions that they have that, where the spines emerge, you know, because some succulents have spines, mm -hmm. but they're not coming from that spiny cushion. And so that's the, that's the distinguishing uh, characteristic. I happen to like the succulents that are, don't have spines because, uh, you know, <laughs> when you're a gardener, you hate dealing with them. Right, exactly. But, uh, it, it's pretty amazing. These, uh, these plants have evolved these defense mechanisms and traits for survival because they store water in really watertight conditions. So everything wants to eat them, everything wants yeah. to, uh, you know, uh, from, from herbivory to uh, just, just surviving, just the heat and everything yeah. else. They're pretty amazing how they've adapted to survive. What kills more succulents than anything else? Probably overwatering. Uh -huh. Overwatering. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we have a, a succulent exhibition right now, right now at the Dixon, and, and one of the things that, uh, that we have are some uh, living rocks, some lithops. Right. I don't know if you've ever heard of lithops. They're from South not. Africa, and they look like stones. They use mimicry as their defense mechanism. Wow. Uh, we have a right. plant that's a euphorbia that looks like sticks. So uh, they ha you know, the leaves are modified so that it looks like dead sticks. Wow. And the lithops look like living rocks is what they call them. They look like rocks. So nothing eats them because they just sort of, they're disguised, I guess, in hiding. Like so anyway, um, they're from, uh, from South Africa. But I was going to tell you, I have killed lithops more times <laughs> than, you never water them. That's the key. If you ever water them, they're just gone. So wow. occasionally you see them at box stores and stuff. They'll have okay. these living stones and you can, uh, they have a pretty hefty price tag, but, uh, <laughs> but I think they're real slow to grow and really difficult. So, so they don't have to be watered pretty much, not at all. It just, they grow in, in, uh, in South Africa in conditions that are really, really wow. arid and hot and inhospitable. So it's, uh, yeah, wow. really dry West facing conditions. So, um, but anyway, we have, uh, if you think about it, there's all these different mechanisms. You know, some plants uh, actually uh, separate, there's sort of a day-night separation in okay. their photosynthetic process where, you know, they're splitting uh, CO2 to, to build, you know, uh, basic photosynthesis that you learn in elementary school. Mm -hmm. But uh, CAM plants, as, as they're called, uh, which is uh, long-term is Crassulacean acid metabolism, oh but CAM is what you need right. to make CAM plants. They actually... Uh, open their stomates, under the okay. little pores under the leaves at night so they can take in the CO2 at night. They hold it in, and then when the sun's shining during the day, they do photosynthesis. That way, if, if they were to open those pores, when it's so hot outside, yeah. they would all the water would just yeah. instantly right. desiccate and right. go out. So anyway, yeah, but, especially uh, here, yeah. But these, these succulents are really, really popular. I, you know, you go to... I was at a, a, a local grocery store and I walk in and they have this succulent display and everybody just loves them because they're, they're easy to care for, you know. Um, because of these adaptive advantages, they're, they're used, you know, a lot of these are hardy outdoors and they're being used as sort of the backbones of the workhorses of everything from green roofs, you know. Uh, yeah. There's a couple of green roofs in Memphis, but uh, they hadn't really caught on. Um, more urban areas like Chicago and New York and stuff, these green roofs are a really big deal. Uh, I think there's acres and acres of green roofs in Chicago and there's wow. uh, uh, tax incentives that t for businesses that 
you know, incorporate this into their uh, their thing. So anyway. Um, well, we need somebody to, you know, introduce those practices here, though, to get yeah, more people to get involved with it. Uh, you know, I think they're, uh, I think Tresvent Manor here has a, has a green roof, and there's a, a, a doctor's office out in, out in Bartlett, I think, okay. that, that has a green roof. Um, but uh, the, certainly the technology's there. Oh, sure it is. But just like, you know, all the questions, you get everything so localized. Yes. And, you know, in Memphis it works one way, and, every, you know, somewhere else it might not work the same way. So... Really, a lot of research needs to be done on which plants yeah. work best. We put in a little green roof at the, at the at the Dixon, which was kind of fun. It's just a small space, but uh, it's kind of neat to see. And then living walls. Do you mm -hmm. know about these living walls? The sort of vertical gardening. Mm -hmm. um, they're real easy to build. We, we just sort of used uh, recycled materials that repurposed. Uh, Susie Askew had kept these big, long troughs that were used for something horticulturally. I don't know if it was a hydroponic mm -hmm. thing or something, but big galvanized troughs and uh, we uh, we made a, a, a media that was real lightweight and uh, and uh, filled these troughs with succulents and so now we and they're sort of louvers and it's a it's a vertical garden at the Dixon it's it's really neat um, tell, tell me this what type of media do you need for succulents I mean what well f fast draining short fast, media okay. yeah as you would suspect um, fast draining you don't want anything that holds a lot of moisture right. and uh, you know they're not big nutrient hogs so they don't need a lot of mm. a lot of you know high nutrients so um, if you had potting soil that you wanted to use for succulents I would just mix in some sand or a little gravel or something um, there used to be a product made across the river that's this clay that they heat up real hot and expand it you ever hear of Arcolite? Arcolite. Arcolite. It used to be sold over in Arkansas. Now I think uh, the nearest supplier is down in, in Alabama, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the product was originally used for, but it's like clay that's been expanded. It has a lot of pore space. But um, you know Paul Little. I do. He, he's of a big, course. He's, he's, he's anybody's talking guy. succulents yeah. in Memphis, you got to know Paul. <laughs> right. But uh, Paul said he used to drive over to Arkansas and get it, and the first time he went over there in his little Toyota pickup truck, he said by the time he made it back to his nursery, his truck was empty because the stuff flew out like that. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. So it's like So it's that. real lightweight. Light. Yeah, yeah, real lightweight. Light. So like kind of like, you know, start, it may be uh, heated bentonite. I'm not sure exactly the product, but um, that works really well for green roofs because it's lightweight. Okay. And uh, different considerations when you're going vertical or covering a rooftop, you know. Okay. Let me ask you about sedums for a second because, you know, folks grow a lot of sedums. Um, again, what type of care do you need for them? Because we actually got a couple of calls at the office about people growing sedums, but the sedums were rotten, rotting for some reason or, uh, or the other. So, yeah, you know, um, what have you seen? But with those? First of all, you need to buy good quality plants from a good nursery that okay. that, that uh, uh, knows what they're doing. I've seen, um, I have seen uh, plants where uh, slugs or snails get in there mm. and can cause some damage. Mm -hmm. I've uh, I've seen sow bugs or, or but I, and I think they're actually uh, eating some of the root. They may be secondary. What are your thoughts on? They can. They can. Sow bugs and pill bugs can eat actually eat foliage. Yeah. So I've I've they seen eat a that. Lot of that. Yeah. But uh, material. In, in general, you put them in, you uh, water them in initially when you plant them to settle the soil and get everything done, and then they're they're really really low maintenance. Okay. I mean, uh, that's what I thought. You know, cut yeah. the water down to a third of what you would normally do. I would say something like that. So. Um, I, I imagine uh, overwatering is probably the, the best w the best way to kill them if you're if you're yeah. trying to get rid of them. So. I imagine you got to have good drainage, but yeah, we've gotten that question a lot here lately, so I just mm -hmm. wanted to run that past you. But they're, I, they're beautiful, a lot of different they colors. Are. They are, and uh, you know, it, there's there's a lot of from small to large. There's a lot of sedums, a lot of succulents. I have a we, Look, we appreciate that, and we can tell that you like talking about yeah. succulents too. Okay. So thanks for the information. Mm -hmm. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, let's talk about pesticide mode of action. Very important, especially when we're talking about dealing with those pests that are out right. here. Insecticides, uh, in insect uh, uh, modes of actions, and, and a little bit of, of fungicides. Uh, mm -hmm. There, mm -hmm. there are uh, uh, important to understand that there are different modes of action of these different products. 
and my first introduction to to insect resistance was 1978 <laughs> 79 when wow. I was doing some work uh, looking at a new product called uh, insecticidal ear tags on cattle to try to prevent uh, to kill uh, uh, horn flies and and face flies and things like that in cattle and and we learned very quickly that the the ear tags were impregnated with a new relatively new class of product called a synthetic pyrethrin or a pyrethroid uh, which is a, uh, uh, and and it worked real well for a year or two and then we started noticing that it didn't do as good a job and I can remember that some of the folks were saying were de denying that there was such a thing as insect resistance and then after a very short while they had to admit there is, and, yeah. and I also, as an extension agent, I can remember uh, recommending uh, seven to kill fleas, mm. uh, and and I remember that that record, the the dosage went up, and, and after a while, the dosage was like ten times what it used to be, and and that's because the fleas were becoming resistant to carbaryl, which is, mm -hmm. which is not as common a, a carbamate type of insecticide is not as common for resistance to develop, but that does happen. Uh, some of the some of the classes of insecticides uh, are. are Resistance happens quicker than others, but uh, it's. Uh, I can give you a list of some of the different modes of action that are out there. There's and there's twenty over twenty. Well, is it because these insects are, are uh, reproducing so quickly, and there's so many generations? Is that is that sort of the key to why this resistance happens so quickly? That and and you know if only uh, you know if you kill ninety eight percent of a population, you think well that's. Pretty good, good. Yeah. but you that two percent that two percent reproduces, yeah. pretty quick. and yeah. probably most of their offspring are also resistant. And then you mm -hmm. can see how over yeah. a period of Doesn't short long. period of time you can have all sorts of problems. And many of these insects have uh, multiple generations per year, right, right. and uh, so that can really create a problem. Yeah. But uh, you know, acetyl cholinesterase inhibitor is one. It inhibits, uh, a, 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 you know, causes a, basically a nerve. Mm -hmm. Gas, the nerve gas that that kills kills insects, and, it, and actually these insecticides were developed from nerve gases were, that were developed uh, back in the uh, 30s and 40s or 20s and 30s for other uses, yes. you know, back yes. then. But uh, uh, you know, they're uh, acetylcholine receptor antagonist. They're uh, nicotine acetylcholine receptor agonist. Uh, they're neonicotinoids we're hearing about now. Right. That, yeah. that mode of right. That's what that is. It targets uh, the central nervous system. Okay. What there, it is. there are insect growth regulators that inhibit yeah. chitin in synthesis, mm. and 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 there are uh, so that like keeps them young or something. Keeps yeah. them young. They <laughs> they can, can't when they're too young to <laughs> reproduce, you can't reproduce. You know, <laughs> and so you, uh, it may not kill you, but it keeps you from reproducing, which is important. That's pretty neat stuff. Uh, molting disruptors. Uh, uh, there are electron transport inhibitors. Uh, uh, there's just there's a lot of different products out there, and you know the take home point from this is. Don't continue to use the same insecticide right. all the time. I know when I was in the cattle business, we would, uh, uh, for years and years and years, cattle producers have used a, a, a back rub. The cows can go under and, and it rubs an insecticide mm -hmm. on their back and it kills the critters. But very, very quickly I learned to use one type of product this year. Next year I completely switched to another. Mm -hmm. You know, I might use a organophosphate. Uh, yeah. This year, and then a pyrethrin next year. Uh, rotate, and you know, rotate your yeah, classes rotate. Uh, to prevent uh, 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 resistance. This resistance management. You're yeah. trying to prevent uh, creating a super. So you super just shift, yeah, super shift totally your mode of action is what right. you're doing. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you can do that. Uh, there are products out there that you'll notice on the on the shelf that have two different products in them, and they have two different yeah. modes of action in them. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of be be careful using those uh, both out at the same time because the critter that survives yeah. that is resistant to, to two modes of action. But fortunately, we got over 20. You know, yeah. we've got a lot. That's that okay. we can that's, do that's with. a lot to choose from. So, uh, like I don't think we're going to have a super bug. Uh, I hope not. Uh, anytime soon. Oh, no. Now, what about fungicides? Like fungicides, the same thing we found it, and that's that was probably the last organism that I've seen that's that's developed a resistance. But it, it, even it's been out there for a while. I remember uh, even back in the 80s, uh, benlate. Mm -hmm. We were using a, a real common benamil, yeah. a real mm -hmm. common fungicide, and and it was not it, it starting not to work as well as it used to, and so they they switched the the classes. Uh, but there are strobilarins, which is uh, 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 
several of the, the real common uh, heritage, heritage Cygnus compass yeah. uh, are examples of strobilurins, which are uh, which we have seen some some uh, fungal diseases develop resistance to in the agricultural community. Mm -hmm. uh, frog eye leaf spot in okay. soybeans is an example, uh, but so. You can add a, a uh, another class of triazole with that, and, and, and in the agricultural community, you usually don't completely switch to another because some of these fungicides have a lot of strength on several diseases. Some of them are have strength on other diseases, mm -hmm. and if you completely stop, you control this disease, and you'll have another disease that'll wipe oh. you out. So, what uh, in the agricultural community? Uh, when the uh, fungal uh, resistance or is encountered, most of the time the, the farmers will have to use a product that's got multiple Simple, modes yeah. of action. Wow. But uh, in your backyard for black spot control and roses, you know, uh, you know, you can go with daconil, but there, there, there are several things that I, Chlorothalonil is, is uh, yeah, where it's yeah, yeah. is another one. Go to, uh, go, and that's, and that's uh, yeah. a strobilurin, yeah. but daconil is not. Uh, the strobilarian, where is dacanil? Uh, chlorothalonil, it's a chloronitrile. Uh, so it's a different, totally different. Uh, it's same thing with with uh, blight on tomatoes. I know mancazeb and yeah. chlorothalonil are, are two fungicides. They're totally different classes. Mancazeb is is uh, uh, diethane four junction pent pentathlon or, or mancazeb, and, and they're, they're uh, in the M3 uh, class, dithyl carbamates and relatives. And then uh, Captan is another yeah, product that yeah. it stands alone. It's in the M4 uh, thal thalamide group. Uh, and, uh, but keep in mind, uh, if, it's, if it has uh, uh, strobilarins, if it has a, a strobin uh, on the end of its active ingredient, paraclostrobin, a zoxystrobin or whatever, it's a strobe. Mm -hmm. And just keep in mind, don't stick with the same fungicide yeah. all the time, mix it up if you can. And that's why I read off all of those when I list a bunch of products that will control the disease. All right, and that's your take home message. So we appreciate that, Mr. D. Uh -huh. All right, here's our Q&A session. And Dale, you jump in there with us. All, all right. right. I, uh, yeah, I've, here's yeah. our first letter. Okay. People are still writing letters. We have a picture that actually came with the letter. It says, Dear Chris, I planted these blackberries in September of last year. The vines have really grown. Should I let the canes grow or should I prune them back? And this is uh, Mr. Vine in Lewisburg, Tennessee. That's a venison question. Yeah, that's Mr. D. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, blackberries. Blackberries are, are inter interesting critters. Uh, okay, they planted them this, this past spring. Planted them spring. September of last year. September of last mm -hmm. year. So... All of the canes produced this year were, were prima canes, right. called prima canes, and they're strictly oh, yeah. vegetative. And so that, I'm sure he didn't have a lot of blackberries this year. Now, uh, the canes that come off the prima canes are, are, are floor canes or are, are the second year. So canes are biannual. The roots are perennial on blackberries. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the canes live two years. First year, the prima canes. Second year, the floor canes. And the the fruit are produced on the floor canes. Yes, you can prune them back. Yes. Uh, probably a good idea to prune them back. Most of the fruit are produced back toward the base of where the floor cane comes out anyway. So I would prune the floor canes back to 18, 20 inches and get them back. And, and uh, uh, if you have erect types, erect blackberries, probably bring them down to 38 to 40 inches in height and, and you'll, you won't adversely affect your fruit production at all. All right, bud, there you have it for Mr. D himself. It will not affect your production. All right, here's our next letter. This is pretty neat, Dale. Yeah. This is writing letters. Mr. Chris Cooper, my crepe myrtle is at least 50 years old and very large. It had a lot of dead limbs in it this spring. The winter must have been hard on it. It still bloomed this year on new limbs. How and when should I prune my crepe myrtle? This is uh, Miss Mary in Blatheville, Arkansas. So, Dale. Let's say you about that. So when is the best time to prune your crepe myrtle and how would you go about doing that? Well, if you're, um, the, the nice thing about crepe myrtles is they flower on new wood. On new you can wood. cut them all the way back to the ground yeah. and you still get flowers. They're, they're really tough. Uh, 
you know, there's a, a, a whole movement. Jason Reeves is part of it. <laughs> yeah. Stop the Stop chop. Stop the chop. You yeah. know, and uh, so, uh, you know, crepe myrtles do have wonderful forms and shapes to them. So I, I like to prune a plant. If you plant a plant in the right place, you should be able to prune it to its natural form. And um, so um, I think prune a crepe myrtle anytime your shears are sharp would be, would be a good analogy. <laughs> but in the, in the winter, you can see the structure sure. better. Sure. But horticulturally, I don't think there is a wrong time to prune a crepe myrtle. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I like to cut back anything that's bigger than, say, the size of a, of a number two pencil. Like mm -hmm. when you were a kid, you know, those big fat mm -hmm. pencils that you used mm -hmm. to I don't even think they do it anymore. You know, <laughs> I don't know. They have mechanical pencils. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> mechanical. So anyway. Yeah, so. Or digital, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, I hope that answered the yeah, question. Yeah, that answered the question. And, I, and I'll tell you something else. Um, anything that's crossed, anything that's diseased. Absolutely. You know, I, I would get dead, rid of those. Dead, dead. crossed, diseased. Always, yeah. You know, get those out of there, you know, mm -hmm. back to the nearest, you know, yeah. larch, branch or limb, or back to the trunk itself. A lot of people like to limb them up to yeah. take the suckers right. off the bottom, limb them up so you can see that beautiful trunk. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're, we're having all the issues with the scale here. Yeah, so We'll yeah. see what, you have to see what that's going to do. I yeah, think. we're going to find out a lot more about crepe myrtles here coming up real soon. Mm -hmm. All right, so I hope that answers your question. All right, here's our next letter. All right. All three letters. All three letters. And look at that. College You're paper. Like College Claus. paper. Yeah, uh, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> we have several Nandina bushes. The tallest is six feet and the shortest is about four and a half feet. How far back can we prune the Nandita bushes and when is the best time to do so? And this is Bill in Rossville, Tennessee. Mr. Bill, we have Dale. I think Dale can help us out with this one. Prune yeah. back those Nandina bushes. Do you want to? You no, have at it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Nandina bushes tend to, uh, they, but their natural habit is sort of very long and leggy, and then they have this horizontal branching at the top. Um, the best way to prune a Nandina is to go all the way down to the base and take out some of the canes. Wow, um, all the way down to the base? All the way down ah, to the base. Okay. You don't really hack them in the back, then they get real bushy at the top. You want to keep that structure where they're very vertical and then horizontal. That's okay. kind of how, how uh, large uh, Nandinas grow. I would say late winter would be late the best time, okay. to, best time to prune them. Uh, you know, a lot of people are concerned if you cut something back hard now that it won't have enough time to harden off good before it freezes, right. and so that makes sense. But um, I like to reach in and sort of thin thin those canes as well. So uh, reaching in, going down low is the way to, best way to prune a Nandina. Wow, down mm -hmm. to the base. Sounds yeah. like blueberries, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. In the back. <laughs> All right, so I hope that answers your question. All right, so here's our next viewer email. My tomatoes would not ripen this summer. How about that? Now that we have had some cooler weather, they are putting out lush green leaves and tons of clusters that are just staying green. This is the first time this has happened. I grow them in pots every year. Has this been a bad year for tomatoes? And this is Miss Elizabeth in Pleasant View. I thought this has been a pretty good year for tomatoes. Ah, uh, it, it's been it, pretty tough. Is it, I, I think, think uh, pollination when it's real hot, it, isn't that a problem? Well, you know, the, the it, it will abort the, you know, the buds when it's, it's, real, hot. When it's real hot. Yeah. Right, but you know, once we get to the temperatures that we have now, which are cooler, yeah. then they're going to start, you know, reproducing yes. like crazy. Uh, but for the, yeah, I, I thought the tomato season's been pretty good. Early on, we had a lot of rain. Yeah, that right. was a big problem. Early on, yeah. but then you know, we kind of got you know a little straight there with the weather, and everybody I know, most of the farmers that are producing tomatoes, was like, hey, this is. It's been good. We're, we're no problem. The uh, optimum temperature for tomatoes to ripen is between 66 and 78 degrees. That's the optimum, optimum. temperature. <laughs> uh, if the temperature is above 85 degrees, the tomato is not able to produce the pigments that will let it get ripe. The lycopene, mm -hmm. uh, there's two or three different pigments mm -hmm. that will cause it to change color. So if you have sustained temperatures above 85 degrees, and we did. Oh, we did. Night about, temperatures above 85 even, degrees. Even, I mean, yeah. I mean, sustained temperatures above 85 degrees, that, and, and we did, up in, even in my area, up in Lauderdale and Dyer County, there were, there were, we had tomatoes that didn't get ripe. Wow. They just okay. sat there on the plant, and they stayed green, and, 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 and they didn't get ripe. But in the middle of the summer, yes. It, it really, and, and up until just a, a, a few weeks ago, it, uh, Tomatoes have really struggled. Wow! In in my area, in your area, okay, they've been uh, fine here from what yeah, I you yeah, know, understand yeah. from the farmers. I, I know yeah. Chris spent some time in, in Corvallis, Oregon, and yeah, I did. too. And mm -hmm. it was it was you. It was the exception when you had a ripe tomato. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The year the green tomato was pretty common. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because it wasn't hot enough. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, Dale, Mr. D, we're out of time. Thanks yep. for being here. Good deal. Oh, All right. Great. Thanks for having us. Fun. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation, the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you.